How could we build a superhero? In this talk, I'm gonna take a look at one route that offers incredible potential. Hi there, I'm Dr. Barry Fitzgerald, and in this talk, I'm gonna take a look at the potential to build a superhero. In reality though, I should be asking two other questions. First of all, can we build a superhero? And second of all, should we actually build a superhero? Now before I look at those questions, I wanna ask a very important one from the start. Well, what is a superhero? And to get an answer to that question, I'm gonna turn to someone who knows a little bit about superheroes, and that is Stan Lee from Marvel Comics. Now Stan Lee created some of the most iconic characters in comic book history, such as the Fantastic Four, Thor, the Hulk, and Spider-Man, and of course, Tony Stark and the Iron Man suit. Now, according to Stan Lee, a superhero is a person who carries out heroic deeds using powers or abilities that a normal person would not be able to use or have access to. And this then eliminates the idea that characters like James Bond or any other action heroes are also superheroes. That's Stan Lee's definition of a superhero. And of course, in terms of superheroes themselves in the literature, well, they're based not only on Earth, but also throughout the universe. And these can be in real places in the universe, such as, of course, planet Earth or the solar system, but also in fictitious parts or elements of the universe that don't really exist or we don't know if they actually exist at all. Now, in terms of the characters that we see in the films, there are many different origins for these characters. Some come from mythology, such as Thor and Loki. In this talk, I'm not gonna talk about the mythological characters. Instead, I'm interested in those that are coming from science, so perhaps from genetics, from bionics, or from wearable technologies. Now, in terms of genetic superheroes, there are plenty of examples in the literature. Perhaps the most famous of those characters is Spider-Man. The Peter Parker, bitten by a radioactive spider, suddenly develops all of these amazing powers, some of which spiders have, some of which spiders do not. Now, these genetic characters are characters that have their powers from genetic manipulation or genetic mutation. Well, they sound a little bit unbelievable. Definitely the idea of getting powers from a radioactive spider is unbelievable. In the real world though, there are scientists working on genetic editing tools like CRISPR-Cas. It's like a scissors that can cut at a particular location in DNA and with that tool you can either remove DNA associated with a disease or put in new DNA into someone or something's DNA. Now this of course has a lot of ethical issues. It's not something you're gonna be jumping into straight away but we don't have to use CRISPR-Cas, and we haven't had to use CRISPR-Cas or tools similar to that in the past to do genetic manipulation because we've done many types of selective breeding with many different animals such as dogs, cows, and others in order to try and get the best attributes for a particular species. Now, in terms of bionic superpowers, there are lots of characters in the films and the comic books who have some bionic element to them. One of those characters is Nebula. Now Nebula, who is the daughter of Thanos, she has got everything from bionic implants in her skull to bionic implants in her arms. In fact, her, some of her hands uh, and parts of her hand are completely bionic or electronic. But we don't have to think about big things when we're thinking about the bionic. An often forgotten bionic invention that we already have is the pacemaker, the device implanted in the heart in order to regulate the rhythm of the heart. So we don't have to think big with bionic uh, uh, implants. We can think small, like things like the, as I say, the, the, the uh, pacemaker. And finally, what about the wearable technologies? Well. You know, we have lots of characters in the superhero films who wear something and then have a superpower. The pinnacle of these, in my opinion anyway, is Tony Stark with the Iron Man suit. In the comic books, I should point out that Riri Williams also developed her own version of the Iron Man suit. It's called the Iron Heart suit. And if you've not heard of Riri Williams before, you're going to over the next couple of years because she's gonna appear in a show on Disney+. Plus. 
Now, wearable technologies, when you put them on, it allows you to do something that you would not be able to do without them. And we've got plenty of those in society. One very simple example would be the idea of going paragliding. So if you want to paraglide, you have to put on a suit that will allow you to fly. And this is a wearable technology that allows you to do something that you could not do without it. Now, thinking wearable is where I wanna go because this, I think, is a great route in terms of trying to build a superhero. And as I said already, there are lots of examples of superheroes who wear technologies to have superpowers. Of course, we've got Tony Stark, we've got Sam Wilson and the X07 flight suit. We also have Adrian Toomes, the vulture from Spider-Man Homecoming. And the thing is, the Iron Man suit, though, in my opinion, getting back to that, is something a bit more extraordinary than the other two suits I just mentioned. In my opinion, it's the ultimate wearable technology and it's also an exoskeleton suit. Now we have history with suits. We have built suits for many different purposes and I just wanna go through some of the reasons why we've built them and demonstrate, well, they're all included in something like the Iron Man suit. Now, let's look at some suit up history. Now, when I talk about suit up history, I'm not referring to Barney Stinson and his famous line from How I Met Your Mother. Instead, I wanna look at the different reasons why we actually turn to suits. Now, we turn to suits for warmth. For example, when it's cold and the weather is, is frightfully freezing, well, then you're gonna put on some warm clothes and clothes, which is an example of a passive exoskeleton suit although the clothing now in the future will probably have some electronics in it as well. But in the past and until now, we've always just put on clothes to help our body stay warm, to keep our core temperature at that 37 degrees Celsius, and also to help our body to thermoregulate properly. Of course, when it gets too warm, you need to take some of the clothing off because you don't want to inhibit the natural thermoregulation of your body. But we still, in cold weather, we turn to clothes, so we use them for warmth. We also use suits and clothing, in this case for protection, but in medieval times you have medieval armor which was built to protect the wearer as they set off to battle or for jousting or for whatever other purpose. We also build suits to survive, to be able to live in and, and survive in environments that we're not normally supposed to be in. This could be a scuba diving gear that you would use to deep dive or when we go to space, the ultimate suit, the astronaut suit, that replicates the all-important atmosphere that we need to breathe, containing oxygen that our cells, of course, crave and need for life. We also have suits that have been built to assist or to help people, particularly in manufacturing. This is an example of one suit, it's called the, from Exobionics, it's an upper body exoskeleton suit that provides support for the arms and the shoulders for anyone who is working with their hands above their head for extended periods during the day. And this is a suit that not only helps the person do their job, but also looks after their body and makes sure they don't have any long-term injuries because of overuse or having been in this position for 40 hours a week for their entire life. You could imagine it put a lot of strain on their bodies. And there are suits that have been developed for well-being, and that's to help people in rehabilitation. And this is an example of an upper body exoskeleton suit that can be used by someone who may have suffered from a stroke and as part of their rehabilitation program. Now, there are all the different suits that we built, but of course, there are the superhero suits, the suits that we see in the superhero films or we read about in superhero comic books with the Iron Man suit, being perhaps the most famous of those suits. Now, when I give a talk, I ask people, what does the Iron Man suit actually do? And the answers I get from people range from things like it flies, it fires rockets, it gives the wearer super strength. All of these things look at the, the obvious, but the Iron Man suit is much more than that. And I wanna point out some of the things that are hidden within the Iron Man suit. Now, first and foremost, it contains self-healing materials. These are materials that when damaged can fix themselves. The Iron Man suit is an electronic device. If the electronic circuits are damaged after a blow from Thor's hammer or a blast from Captain Marvel, well, Tony Stark is in a little bit of trouble because his suit's gonna be broken. But the suit definitely contains self-healing materials, which are materials that when they are damaged, 
they can fix themselves. And for electronic circuits, that's really important. You can have electronic circuits which contain little droplets of liquid metal. So if some part of the circuit is damaged, the liquid metal droplet will burst and it will replace that broken electrical circuit. And this is scattered all over the suit. It has to be, considering what Tony Stark puts the suit through in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now the next thing is that the suit contains nano-based wound healing technologies. In Avengers Infinity War, Tony Stark fights Thanos on Titan and suffers a very serious injury. And to deal with that injury, he uses a spray from the suit. Now that spray will help to seal or heal the wound, but it also will look to try and eliminate any pathogenic infections that could take place and also will assist the body in the process of actually healing up the wound. It will maybe call more fibril or, or bring more platelets towards the wound to try and seal it faster. The suit is also quite extraordinary in the fact that it doesn't need to have a pilot on board the suit. You can actually fly this suit and use this suit as a drone. So this is without someone actually in the suit. And Tony Stark does use this in the films, but in terms of the real world, drones, which we know as this, well, they can be used for many different reasons, but what we'd really like to see them used for is not in warfare, but perhaps to help people, doing things like search and rescue, perhaps to transplant donor organs, or to transport humanitarian aid. That's where that technology can be used. And in some ways, we do see Tony Stark using the drones for that purpose in the films, but not as often as using them in battle. But it's good to keep in mind that they could be employed in that manner as well. And finally, well, it's got a lot of machine learning applications or machine learning applied to the suit, given that it's got a natural language user interface, otherwise a voice assistant. That is Jarvis or Friday or whoever or whatever the voice assistant is. Now that assistant would have to be trained using machine learning algorithms and trained with a certain amount of data and of course then interacts with Tony Stark or whoever the wearer happens to be. Now these voice assistants are highly advanced in the films as we have seen and we do have voice assistants in the real world like Alexa and Siri, but they're not as advanced as the ones that we've seen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe or the ones we've seen in Tony Stark's Iron Man suits. But one particular problem that I wanna get onto now, particularly in relation to the voice assistants, is that, well, they could be biased and they may have unconscious bias due to how they were programmed or trained. And that's something that needs to be addressed when you want to build a wearable technology, something like this Iron Man suit or the Iron Heart suit built by Riri Williams. You have gotta think about bias, you have gotta think about standardization of the technology, and you have gotta think ethically about it. Now, Tony Stark is a genius. I don't wanna take that away from him. But on the other side, he hasn't really thought very ethically about his development in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And he has introduced quite a lot of bias unconsciously into the technology. As I mentioned, you need to train the voice assistants with some data, and that data is all coming from him, one person. You can imagine that it's quite biased in that sense. He also has facial recognition technologies in the suit, and they for sure are more than likely biased. There's a lot of scientific evidence out there that demonstrates that facial recognition technologies are biased, that they're unfair, and that they should not be deployed or used in society. And in the case of Tony Stark, don't think he should have them in the suit because there definitely is an element of bias there too. Another thing to think about is, well, the suits need to be standardized. That means you need to make them in a certain way that is standardized and approved for, for example, use around uh, for other people in society or for other purposes. And there's no way that Tony Stark standardized these suits. No way, only for himself. So you need to think about that as well. And finally, you need to think ethically about building this suit. How are you going to do it? Who are you gonna to talk to? Where are you gonna get the permissions to build the suit? And Tony Stark didn't do any of that. So don't do that. You need to make sure that you get proper permissions, that you follow proper ethical protocols, that you get approval from ethical boards, whether it's at universities, whether it's at gov from government agencies or otherwise. 
it's imperative you do that if you're trying to build the ultimate wearable technology. Now, what should you do moving forward? Well, I think the first thing to do is don't be Tony Stark in the sense of don't be someone who introduces unconscious bias into technology, don't approach it in an unethical manner, and follow the proper scientific protocols in terms of the development. But do be Tony Stark in terms of following your dreams, exploring the possibilities, following the ideas, and testing things, and seeing what works, and seeing what does not work. But be yourself and build it right. Whether you want to build a wearable technology and be a superhero, or whether you just want to build something that will be good for you, good for the people you know, and good for the planet at large. And one other thing I gotta say is this. When it's ready and you're finished, I will gladly be the test pilot for any potential wearable technology, even if it, particularly if it flies. So if you do manage to achieve it, be sure to reach out and get in contact with me. Thanks very much for listening to this talk. This is some of my information in relation to where you'll find me online, on YouTube, on, on Twitter, on Facebook, and Instagram. And you can also find me on Facebook and on Instagram at BW Science. So in this talk, I've had a look at the possibility of building a superhero and, and tried to answer questions like, can we build a superhero? Should we build a superhero? They're big discussions, and I'll leave those to you to think about and ponder, and maybe get back to me and let me know what you think. But at the end of the day, the goal was to take a look at how we could build a superhero, and I hope I've provided you with some of the key information to get you over the line. I've been Dr. Barry Fitzgerald. Thanks very much for watching, and until I see you next time, always think super.